Welcome to Lecture 3, Part 2 on Golf Minute and the Presentation of Self. And in this recording, we will be debating Goffman's legacy. So the first point really to make here is thinking about history and actually holding Goffman to better account. Now, Goffman is writing and formulating his ideas in the context of Jim Crow. And as we know, Jim Crow laws were a collection of state and local statutes that legalised racial segregation in the states. They were named after a black minstrel show character. The laws, which existed for over for about 100 years from post-Civil War to around the, the end of 1968, were meant to marginalise African-Americans by denying them the right to vote, hold jobs, get an education and other opportunities. These laws of segregation in the US South were a way of life and the black freedom struggles that were shaking the social interaction order at the time, they were shaking it to its foundations at the very moment he crafted his account. Now there's some names that you will recognise, for example Rosa Parks in 1955 who couldn't find a seat in the black section at the back of a bus, took one at the front of a bus. and. The driver then instructed Parks to give up her space for white passengers and when she refused she was arrested. Um, Rosa Parks has largely come to be known as the mother of the modern day civil rights movement. On September the 3rd 1957, nine black students known as the Little Rock Nine arrived at their high school to begin classes and were instead met by the National Guard and a screaming threatening mob. They tried again a couple of weeks later and made it inside, but had to be moved for their safety when violence ensued. So despite making some gains, black people in America were still experiencing blatant prejudice in their everyday lives. Um, I want to just look at the example of the Greensboro sit-ins. So in February 1960, four college students took a stand against segregation in Greensboro, North Carolina, when they refused to leave a Woolworths lunch counter without being served. And over the next several days, hundreds of people joined their cause in what became known as the Greensboro sit-ins. Now, after some were arrested and charged with trespassing, protesters launched a boycott of all segregated lunch counters until the owners caved in, and the original four students were finally served at the Woolworths lunch counter where they'd first stood their ground. And I want us to think about what we could make of all of this when we're thinking about everyday life, right? These are, as Joyce Lantner and Imogen Tyler talk about, interactional forms of political res resistance, and they're largely absent in Goffman's writing. Now, Goffman is writing at this time, so where are these accounts of the interaction order in everyday life? Can he really excuse or hide the place of power and um, the context of social interactions to help us understand not only why the world is the way it is, but also how it could be? Now, one suggestion for the absence and the silence in Goffman's work on this particular interactional order in everyday life, as Joyce Ladner points out, is that US sociology has been historically segregated in that, at least until the 1960s, there were two distinct institutionally organized traditions of sociological thought in the States, one black and one white. And for the most part, dominant written histories about the birth of American sociology and about American sociology generally have been silent on that segregation. So at best, what happens is they reproduce it when addressing the US sociological tradition, they silence the contribution of key African-American sociologists and African-American experiences. So even within the Academy of Sociology, the silences from Goffman have arguably contributed to reproducing inequalities. These are examples of violent interactions in everyday life. And if you look at this quote here, we can see that where, where these interactions happen in everyday life are at places like 
public transport, churches, swimming pools, libraries, parks, cinemas, housing developments, city halls, rent strikes and so forth. Tyler also suggests that Goffman's suppression of the question of power is itself constitutive of the erasure of black African-American sociology in white mainstream sociology. And Ladner very powerfully talks about this in her book, The Death of White Sociology. And this is really interesting, I think, because Goffman talks about going off script, but it can have, as we know, very real life and death consequences the Greensboro Four, for example, Rosa Parks, for example, the children in Little Rock, but also more recently with the, the phenomenon of the Black Lives Matter movement as a pushback against the systemic historical violence meted out against African-Americans in the United States for the past 400 years. And if you look at the storyboard for topic two, you'll see a number of illustrative examples of people who are accused of occupying the wrong kinds of spaces in those everyday encounters while picking litter, for example, while going out for a run, um, driving in one particular place or standing on a particular street corner. And so this, again, is really vitally important, but seems to be lacking in Goffman's focus on the micro sociological which is, seems to be separated out from engagement with questions of power. And it goes to this point here about how we can problematise the very idea of the everyday. How do we question it? We have to ask ourselves when we talk about the everyday, where is it? Whose is it? How does it happen? Is it a level playing field? Is it accessible to everybody all of the time? Is it available to everybody? Are we equally entitled to occupy these everyday spaces? And again, I hope that the examples that I've posted on the storyboard and those other examples that you will see from reading in the news will help you kind of engage with this question of the everyday in a more critical way. And Goffman's work has been criticised in a number of ways, in fact. Um, the first one we want to look at is this, this question that Giddens asks, are we ever sincere, right? Social actors may be viewed as performers who appear to present themselves to others in a false or manipulative fashion. The tactfulness displayed in social encounters, especially maintaining the status quo, requires diplomacy and adherence to social rules where we are thinking always about social self-presentation goals. But are we simply manipulators? Goffman seems to presuppose that we are all cynical actors. And Giddens asks, where is sincerity? Are we ever sincere? And this links to the next point about um, emotion management. And Goffman's actors merely carry out what early Hochschild would call surface acting, but are psychologically absent in some way. The emphasis on performance suggests that there's no sense of an inner self in Goffman's observations of social interaction. There is also this kind of blurring of the private and public lives, which feels sometimes a little bit unclear um, and slightly ethnocentric as well. I mean, does it apply to beyond Western societies? How does that apply to different cultures? I mean, especially in the Western way of seeing the world in the dichotomy of public private spheres, the dramaturgical analogy might work well for Western societies such as the US and the UK, but perhaps not so useful in societies where there is not such a marked division between the public and the private. Um, and also the public and the private have become increasingly blurred. If we think of the very moment we're in where we are teaching from our homes, we are studying from our homes, we are working from our homes, and we have these images of our homes behind us, and we're performing um, in those spaces all of the time. So there is this kind of blurred front stage, backstage. The blurring of the front stage, backstage seems to be lacking in Goffman's account. And 
the focus on everyday interaction between individuals arguably underplays the extent to which social relations are shaped by wider structures of power, social class, race, gender. Um, Goffman underestimates the power of the wider social structures and Goffman actually would agree with that and would state that this micro level analysis and theorising was for um, was his domain and the macro level analysis was for other sociologists. For Goffman there isn't a straightforward relationship between interaction and larger social structures and sometimes it can be relevant but can have nothing to do with what transpires. The critique remains however where is the engagement with power? It can be found, but at a micro level, it's not abstract, but it permeates through interactions and people's behaviours towards each other and uh, mundane actions can be an act of power. Goffman argues that these can be bracketed off to the microanalyst. And yet this still doesn't resolve this very troubling question, I think, that his career spanned the most tumultuous decades of resistance of disadvantaged groups in American history to roles and, and socialization and scripted behaviors. That Goffman was able to write and analyze social relationships and see social interaction as a performance always in the everyday context, but without engaging with the wider political context seems problematic. And Goffman doesn't really have an answer for that. So just to kind of recap here and, and think through what has been discussed in this recording and the first part one, what we've been looking at is exploring micro sociology and social interactions using Goffman's dramaturgical approach. And in doing so, we can understand processes of impression management through the roles we play in everyday life. Goffman argues that individuals are constrained to define themselves in terms of these roles um, and the relationships in each society and to each other. Fundamentally, it comes down to this. Goffman says that the self is, is social. The self is a social product. And this is a key message and link to the topic theme. The self is a product of performances that individuals put on in social situations. And that we draw on a large amount of internalised and tacit knowledge which provides everyday encounters with the quality of regularity and ritual that helps us understand them. But a the last point I want to make here is that what we also must have is a critical engagement with Goffman and that this requires that we locate wider macro structures in our use of the dramaturgical perspective. And this is really critical because Goffman does expertly um, open up to us a powerful way of thinking about the socially constructed nature of all aspects of identity. But we can extend this to look at the way social identities are also classed, racialized and gendered. And in doing so, we are very careful when we think about not just the way the world is, but how it could be different. And this reveals the transformative nature of thinking sociologically about the relationship between the individual and society.